The basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to get started for this morning, we're going to play a little trivia game about current events dealing with our country. Let me ask you this first question and see if you can come up with a guess. In 2021, how much was spent by businesses and special interests to lobby our Congress? Let's take a second to guess. The answer is $3.73 billion to lobby Congress. And if you take that number and you divide it by the number of congressional members, that's roughly $6.97 million spent for lobbying or laws of any kind on each congressional member. Now here's another one. What is the net worth of senators on average in the United States? $3.2 million. Now what's the net worth of those in the House of Representatives on average? It's $900,000. And one more question. What is the average pay of a congressional member on average every year? It's $174,000 a year. When you look at the history of the world and you take every empire that has arisen, you take every country, very often times you find the wealthy at the top and the poor on the bottom. Even in democracies like in ancient Greece, the people that were allowed to vote were land-owning free male citizens. When it came to Rome, they said in times of their republic that the plebeians, the average people, had a say. But when they weighted the votes of the Senate with the rich ruling class, oftentimes the Senate vastly outweighed the rights of the average individuals. And this would lead throughout the rise of these republics, these democracies, to more and more corruption until you would get to the time of dictatorships and empires, when even more so, the wealth of the, those that had land, who owned slaves, would trample on the rights of the poor. But then fast forward even to the beginning and founding of our nations. It was the same way at the start of our country. It was the wealthy, it was the ruling class who held the power and those that had not very much at all that didn't have much of a say in things. The history of the world is one of oppression, of the haves and the have-nots. And oftentimes this is directly tied into the history of the church because throughout the history of the church, those that latch on to the gospel promise of Jesus are very often those that have nothing. Because their hearts are not set on the things of this world, they see that the gospel of Jesus is the most important thing. Having their treasures in heaven is the most important thing. And so when they see oppression, when they see injustice, when they see the division between haves and have-nots and the resulting immorality that often comes, their hearts are troubled within them. We can look on the pages of Scripture and find this again and again and again. In fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the wisest man apart from Jesus Christ to ever live in around 950 B.C., Solomon, says this, If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. And so we as Christians will look at the text from James today and see that all of the things that we have just mentioned were demonstrating itself in the time of the Roman Empire when the Apostle James is writing himself. The rich are oppressing the poor. And even the rich of the congregations that were claiming to be Christians were oppressing their brothers and sisters in the faith. They were the ones that hired the slaves of the congregation out in the fields. And what were they doing? They weren't paying their wages to the workers. Or if they were, they were shortchanging them 
and not giving them what they deserved. And so the people had nowhere to turn. They had nowhere to get justice for themselves. And what could they end up doing? And maybe we sometimes say the same to ourselves when we analyze the world. You can get down quite a deep rabbit hole if you look at all the different ways that you see corruption in the world today. But what is it that we can then do? What can be done against oppression and injustice? Our text for today tells us what our Savior Jesus would have us do. And it's not to gripe. It's not to complain. It's not to moan. It's not to point the finger, but it's to be patient and wait for him to come. James says this, and I'll start with the context of it so that you understand who he is addressing and the situation that he is talking about. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. But now listen to what he says to those who are true brothers and sisters in the faith. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. See, God wasn't against the rich just for the sake of being rich. He was against most of the rich because they did not trust in Jesus as their Savior. They were caught up in ungodliness and wickedness. And so today, too, we don't want to say that God sees the rich as people that he doesn't want to save, but those that use their positions of wealth and power to keep their thumbs on the little guy, to make life miserable for them, and to stay rich while other people suffer, God has a very real problem with them. And as his followers, so do we. And the more that Christians become vocal about immorality in a given culture, the more that they will encounter opposition from the devil himself, from the unbelieving world around them, and from their own sinful flesh. Our flesh might say to us, just be quiet, don't rock the boat, don't cause waves, don't make issues. You don't need to testify to Jesus now. Just be patient, but don't open your mouth. Still other times we may open our mouths and have a lot of anger and vitriol behind our words and not show the same patience and love that our Savior did. And all of it, I think, stems from this, that sometimes when we look at the world and we're deeply bothered by it, we forget who's ultimately in control. The reason we start to worry and be afraid of evil men in power, of evil women in power, is because we don't remember that our Savior God is stronger than everyone on the face of the earth. Martin Luther once said that Jesus has more power in his little finger than the devil has in his entirety. And now stop and think about the world at large. What is it that bothers you sometimes? Maybe it's even the fact that you live and work in a job where you see corruption taking place. You yourself have experienced injustice and you wonder, when is this finally going to be healed? It ultimately goes to the question of why is the world this way? And we have to go all the way back to the garden to see that the world is this way because our ancestors fell into sin and because we ourselves so often fall into it. But that grinds on us. It grates at us. And sometimes instead of trusting in God, we worry and are afraid. But when that is the case, Remember what we're told in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 37, 
This is what King David says to us. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. And just three more verses from this psalm. Better the little that the righteous have, that's you and me, than the, wicked of, than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And then at the very end of this psalm, he says this for our comfort. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. We can look to our Savior Jesus who came in humility to rescue us and redeem us and look ahead also to him coming as the powerful judge to make sure that the playing field is leveled, that all those who have oppressed those that have nothing will get their due and all the righteous who have trusted in him will get their reward. We heard about it in the Old Testament lesson this morning when he said his recompense is with him, divine retribution, and he will come to save you. It might seem as if sometimes we are losing, but we can never lose with Christ on our side. And just stop and think too about what Jesus did for you while he was living in this world. Jesus knew the deepness of the wickedness of this world. He knew that it was absolutely hopeless from this side of things for the poor. But what did he come and do towards those in authority? You don't see Jesus as he interacts with the Pharisees or interacts with Herod or interacts with Pilate. You don't see him constantly pointing the finger at them. You don't see him inciting the people against them to stir up bitterness and anger and hate. You see instead Jesus coming to show all people, even those in authority, patience. But also you see something else that Jesus did for us. There was a calm assurance about him that his times were in God's hands. Think about the times where he got up in the temple and proclaimed that he was the coming Messiah and what happened. The Jews got so angry with him that they picked up stones and were ready to stone him or they got, came after him and they were ready to throw him off a cliff. And never once do you see Jesus get riled. Never once do you see Jesus get afraid. Instead, because he knows it's not yet his time and his father holds him in his hands, he just walks straight through the crowd, unperturbed, unbothered, secure in his father's love. That was done for us. And even when it came to the cross then, where he was put to death by all those who stood against him, even there he prayed on behalf of the world, and even then he didn't let that get to him. Instead, he took his laments and his cries to his father, asking why he forsook him. But in the end, after he pays for your sin and mine, for all of our sins of worrying and being afraid, after that, what does he say to the father as he dies? He says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. That prayer can be ours today as well. So maybe you have experienced wrongs that are done to you relationally. Maybe somebody really did deeply hurt you. Maybe you have experienced it in the business world. Maybe even some of you have experienced it in the political world. But don't give up your hope in Jesus. He is coming for you to rescue and save you. And even now, he protects you and keeps you safe. And the way that James reminds us of this is to use some examples from the Old Testament. Do you remember Job? Do you remember what happened to Job? Do you remember how much Job lost? The devil asked God for permission to test Job and because God knew that Job would continue to trust in him, God allowed it. And so the devil came and in one day, he killed all of Job's children, 10 children, all dead at one time. A windstorm blew in, collapsed the house on top of them and they were all gone. And on that same day, there were invaders that came and they took all of Job's flocks and some of them were struck to death and he ended up with nothing. And at the end of all that, what did Job say? The Lord gives, the Lord takes, 
May the name of the Lord be praised. And if that wasn't enough, there was still more. Then the devil came to God and said, Ah, but if you let me harm his body, then he'll turn against you. And God said, Okay, go for it, but do not take his life. And then he was covered from head to foot with boils all over, itchy, scratchy, painful. And in seven days he sat silent with his friends that came to him to support him in his darkness. And he sat and he sat and he sat and he suffered and he suffered and he suffered. And at the very end of it all, after God comes to him and tells him not why he did it all, but that he should just continue to trust in him and his power and wisdom, this is what he does for Job. We're told in Job chapter 42, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends, not with Job. Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. He tells them to sacrifice. But then he goes on in verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, the third Karen Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man and full of years. Oftentimes, the devil wants us to think that this life is only miserable. And some of you might struggle with that more than others, but we all can have those thoughts at times. He wants us to think that there only will be bitterness in this world and to not see the good that God ultimately will bring. But God in his love as our Father is full of compassion and mercy. The word in James that is used for compassion isn't the one that's normally used in the Gospels where we're told that Jesus felt love for people in his gut. It's that word, but then the word for much or more is added at the very front of it. And so what James is saying in this text is, God is filled to bursting with compassion and love for you. It's like his heart is just dripping, seeping with his mercy and love for you, especially when you go through hard times. Because we're told in scripture, he does not willingly bring affliction on mankind. He doesn't take pleasure in it. Though he allows it, it is only for a time. And he doesn't just give us deliverance in the future. He also gives us promise and blessing in the present. Think of all the good things that God has given you despite all the challenges that he has brought you through. You wouldn't be able to even list them all in one sitting if you were being honest with yourself. God does care for you. Even when we go through the darkest of valleys, our good shepherd is there to provide for us abundantly, to soothe and still our souls, and give us that promise that I have always forgiven you, I will always forgive you and love you. You only need look to my cross and you only need look at the empty tomb where I've defeated death for you. But if I did that, am I not also going to bless you abundantly in this world as well? And the answer, the answer is always, yes, he will. But even if we don't get the riches of Job, know that we have way more than we could ever ask or deserve, both now and in eternity. There's one more thing that we need to talk about this morning. It's his direction for us as Christians and how he wants us to live when we experience that bad in the world. Not just to be patient, but what he also asks us to do is not grumble. And you say, what's the connection? How many of you have had a bad day at school or work and you get home and you're talking to your friends or your family member, you're talking to your brother or your sister and they say something to you like, Why are you so crabby? What's got to you today? Why is everything so bad right now for you? And very often what happens is when we're dealing with something with another individual, 
we're angry and upset and frustrated with them, it ends up overflowing onto everybody else in our life as well. When we're quick to find what's wrong with other people out there and be bitter and complain, that often then gets directed at those closest to us. And so we can fault find with those sitting right next to us. And that same thing happens within the church. Maybe you have gotten angry or frustrated with people in the church recently. Maybe it's the person that's sitting halfway across the church from you. Maybe you even avoid them, you avoid talking to them, you avoid interacting with them because you have something on your shoulder about them. Or maybe it's not something that happened recently. Maybe it happened a year, two years, three years ago, and you still harbor it in your heart as something that is wrong with them. What God would ask you today is to consider his faithfulness and love to you, the blessings that he has shown you, and then with them, forgive. Leave it behind. Don't grumble and complain. Go to them, apologize if it is necessary, or if it's something that they don't even know. Maybe that's very often the case. They said something and you just think, how could they say such a thing? But you've held on to it now today with God's help. Let it go. Maybe even it comes to the fact that you haven't wanted to be with those brothers and sisters in church. Maybe they really did wrong you. And if there's a reason you're maybe not coming to church because of that, let it go. With God's help, I'm sure that some people said things that they regret. Maybe even myself, not just maybe. I say things I regret every single day. Put my foot in my mouth. But what God wants us to do then is to turn to one another and offer each other welcome in the name of Jesus. To build each other up, not to fault find, not to be bitter and complain, but instead to see everyone sitting next to us, both men and women and boys and girls, as the souls that he has bought on the cross. Those who are washed in his blood and as such then are fellow saints. It's hard to see that, right? When you know someone else's sin, it's hard to see them as saints, but that's exactly what they are. And to remember this last point too, that if we have to be patient with others, doesn't that also mean that sometimes we are the ones that people need to be patient with? Doesn't that mean that we also have wronged others and need forgiveness? The answer is yes. But remember what James says at the end of his text. We have a God of compassion and mercy. And so each and every day he deals with us as he always has in the past reminding us that he has washed our sins away and made us his own, reminding us that we have nothing to be afraid of because he holds all of human history and our lives in the palm of his hands. Do not fret, do not worry, do not grumble, do not complain, but instead trust in the Lord. Be patient, he's coming and coming soon for you and for me to bring us home. Amen.